Okay, so reflectors versus refractors. The astronomers prefer one over the other. Any idea what astronomers prefer? The reflectors or the refractors? Reflectors. And we actually like the reflectors more. Historically, we made a lot of refractors initially. But there are all sorts of downsides, particularly if you want to make the telescopes bigger. And as you'll see, there are good reasons to make telescopes bigger. We keep making them bigger and bigger. The largest ones in existence, surface or space, about 10 meters across. And we're now designing the next generation where the mirrors are going to be 30 meters across. I mean, 30 meters is a, you know, a good chunk of a football field. Anyway, we'll get to that later, why bigger ones are better. But as we go into that size regime, there are all sorts of limitations. There's limitations in any size regime. So we prefer reflectors. over refractors for a number of reasons. I'll just list them one, two, three, four. So the first reason is chromatic aberration. Let me get the term there first. Chromatic aberration 1b, 2r. Okay. So this has to do, again, remember, a lens can be thought of as a bunch of prisms, and one property we know about prisms is if you send white light into it, you get a rainbow out. And the reason is, as we said with prisms, you send light into it, its path gets deflected. The amount of deflection depends upon the wavelength of the light. Different wavelengths will refract more, the blue ones, and other wavelengths will refract less, the red ones. And so you can actually break the light up into its colors. Uh, we call it a dispersing agent. It's one way that you can get a spectrum. But in terms of a telescope, this is not necessarily a very beneficial property. Imagine building a lens out of glass, which is a very natural thing, as the white light goes in, the light that comes out is being bent to different focal lengths. The red light, its path was changed less, and so it focuses farther out. The blue light, its path was changed more, so it focuses closer in. And so here we have different detector positions. The one that's far away is at the red focus, but the green, the blue, all the other colors are out of focus here. Here, if we put a detector here, the blue is in focus, but the green is a little out of focus and the red is a lot out of focus. Here, the red is in focus and the blue is a lot out of focus. You can only focus on one color at a time if you're using a refractor. Because lenses do that. They have this chromatic, in other words, color aberration. So that's not a good property of a telescope, one that makes out of focus images if you're looking at a range of different wavelengths of light. Is there any questions about chromatic aberration? Okay. Second reason is uh, the absorptive properties. Lenses tend to be made of glass or some glass-like substance. You can get them made out of all sorts of different things. As you can imagine, they're transparent in the visible, but not always transparent in the infrared and ultraviolet. Absorption. So infrared and ultraviolet absorption. If you can see through a piece of glass, it doesn't necessarily mean that the ultraviolet's going through or the infrared's going through. A good example are the windows in your car. As you're driving along, you don't know how long it took to find a picture like this, Googling car side window, arm, warmth, sunburn. I finally, I found one. Uh, but as you're driving along, you can feel the heat on your arm coming through the window. That's infrared. Infrared is heat. The infrared is getting through. But you don't usually don't get a sunburn unless you're driving with the window down. So the heat's getting in, the visible light's getting in, because clearly I can see the scene, but I'm not getting a sunburn because the particular glass, what it's composed of, does not let the ultraviolet through. It's blocking the ultraviolet, which is good in terms of not getting a sunburn while you're driving there, but in terms of astronomy, maybe we want to look at the ultraviolet light. We can push out into the ultraviolet a little bit before the atmosphere blocks it from space. So we might want to see that ultraviolet radiation, but if we're going with a refracting telescope that might block it, if we use a different type of glass that lets the ultraviolet in in the visible, it might not let the infrared in. And so it's, it's hard to come up with a substance that allows everything. It's very expensive. So the absorption properties at non-visible wavelengths, that's a drawback. Third is the weight. And a couple of reasons why. Here, I'll move case four down. One is, with refractors, they're top-heavy, top-heavy support. So here's the world's largest refractor. It's the uh, 
Yerkes 40 inch. 40 inch is the size of the lens at the very top of the tube. It's like seven stories long, this tube. Uh, and this is a well over a hundred year old telescope. So that gives you an idea of when astronomers started switching from lenses to mirrors. This is about as big as you can do it structurally, at least given the technology at the time. At the top you have a lens, it's a meter across, 40 inches is a meter. And then you have this long tube, and basically the lens, its focal point is at the bottom of the tube with um, Professor Cudworth. Yerkes is in southern Wisconsin, it's owned by University of Chicago, which is in Chicago. And uh, that's where I did my grad work, so I actually know that guy, he was one of my professors. Anyway, all the weight is in the glass. Right? The glass is heavy, a one meter chunk of glass. But you then have to build this big structure and balance that weight, and all the weight's up there. But so here's the lens, 40 inches across, the same lens that they put in over 100 years ago is still there. Big, heavy thing, and you've got to balance it up there. And you can imagine it's a tricky engineering problem. It can't shake. If it shakes, your image is out of focus. You've got to hold that. I don't know what the lens weighs, but it's a tremendous amount, and you have to hold it perfectly steady without any shake or variation. You actually got to be moving at a slow rate to compensate for the Earth's rotation perfectly steady. But with the reflecting telescope, the mirror is on the bottom. You can support it from underneath. From an engineering point of view, that's a lot easier to do. You can build a telescope with all sorts of support underneath and you point it around. But supporting the weight up top is challenging. So top heavy support. Also edge only support. You look here, the mirror we can support from behind. But the lens we can only support from the edges. So we have to hold it here and here and all points around the circumference. But we can't support it any other way. It's like a one-dimensional ring that we're supporting it. But the mirror we can support the entire two-dimensional surface from underneath. Again, the engineering is easier because of that. Let me just back up and point out this is a really awesome telescope. Although I was a grad student in Chicago, I never made it up to Europe East, their historic observatory. It's not a place of cutting edge research anymore. But the old historic telescope is still there, some of the faculty work out of there. And I recently went there because they have a 40 inch reflector also on the other side of the building that they're updating and putting into Skynet. Well, when I was there, it was a clear night and Professor Cudworth said, hey, do you want to observe with the historic 40 inch? It's a very awesome experience. That dome is Huge. The telescope is like seven stories, so the dome is even bigger. And basically, it's so perfectly balanced, you just grab onto the back end of it and move it around but with your hands to whatever you want to look at. It's perfectly balanced. And if you want to look at something low on the horizon, then the eyepiece it is, you know, you'd have to get like a giant ladder, a three or four story ladder, to climb up to look to it. But that's what the floor is. The floor is actually the world's largest in terms of square feet elevator. And, so, and he actually let me move the elevator. So that's good. And I didn't break it. So, you know, one person moves the telescope, someone else moves the floor up, and make sure the two don't hit one another. And then you can observe. So that brick wall can be completely hidden. And when you're looking at something low on the horizon, or you can have the floor much lower down, like you do in this particular picture. Very cool observing experience. Oh, something else about edge-only support. <coughs> we think of glass as a solid, but it's, it's over long periods of time, like decades, hundreds of years, it's, it, it has liquid-like properties. It flows. It doesn't hold its shape. In this piece of glass, wherever it is here, if I just leave it here for a couple centuries, it will, it will deform under its own weight. Not very much because it doesn't weigh very much, but that lens weighs a tremendous amount. It's only being supported from the edges, so nothing's really holding it in place from above and below. And so over time, it, it changes. It, it moves as gravity pulls and tugs on it. When not in use, they try to stow it in a particular configuration to minimize the tug of gravity on, on this molasses-like substance. But uh, there, are, And so far, it's worked out. But there are refractors all across the U.S., uh, well over half a century old, that have cracked and broken just under the stress of gravity over time, tugging on that um, glass composite substance. So they, they don't have a infinite shelf life, again, because you can't support them the way that you would need to support 
a substance that can change its shape. And the final point is on polishing. You have two sides to polish. With a mirror, you only have one side to polish. You know, you get there, you have some machine that's designed to polish parabolic surfaces, and it does it. You don't have to worry about the other side. It can be crude, and you just attach it to the support structure. But here, you polish one side, and that's not good enough. You have to flip it over and polish the other side without scratching up the first side while you're applying pressure on the second side. So you can imagine, from a manufacturing point of view, it's more challenging and more expensive. I would throw in cost as another explanation, but really cost is tied to pretty much all of these things. If you want to defeat these different properties with a refracting telescope, you can do it. It just costs a lot of money and it's cheaper to do the reflectors. All right, so that's it for refractors. And you all have your eyes. You, you carry two refracting telescopes, but other than that, we're going to focus on uh, reflecting telescopes. Any questions at this point?